I always say open your Bibles, but this morning I'm going to put everything up here. <clears throat> Those of you who know my, my story from the time I was saved in January of 1984, I, ha I was in certain groups for certain amounts of time. And when I left the Pentecostal group and I went to the Plymouth Brethren, I learned things about the Bible from them that I had, could never have learned from the first group. Then when I left them, went to the Nazarene church, I learned things about the Bible I could not have learned from the other group. Then I left them, I went to Independent Fundamental Baptists. I learned things about the Bible I couldn't have learned from the first three groups. Then I went, left Independent Fundamental Baptists and went to the Acts 9 group. I learned things from them I could never have learned from all the other groups. So it's been a growing thing. Then I, you know, everybody knows I left the Acts 9, sort of. You know, I'm still rightly dividing the word of truth, of course. You know, that, the rightly dividing is non-negotiable. <laughs> you know, you have to rightly divide to understand the word of God. You, you, is this, like that, that's not you, something that you can just put on the, throw out in the garbage and, and get rid of that. That's not, that's not how it works. So, you know, I learned in the group that I was in about uh, time past, but now, let me put this thing in here, because it don't work without that. I learned about time past, but now, and ages to come. Everyone in here who learned this rejoiced when you learned this because the confusion of the Bible just completely, just completely went away, right? And so we understood that not everything in the Bible was written to us, that there were people in the Bible who were speaking to other people besides us in this dispensation of grace. So this understanding of time past but now ages to come is very important. So like I said, rightly dividing the word of truth is not negotiable for a proper understanding of the word of God. But after I left the Acts 9, I realized that that's not all there is to the Bible. I mean, it certainly is the foundation of understanding the Bible. But foundations are not designed to set your laurels on and rest there forever. Foundations are designed to build on, to build upon, and to continue building with the eternal Word of God. You understand? So... The Bible, as we have it today, is separated into more than time past, but now, and ages to come. It's separated into many ages. Like the Apostle Paul says here in Colossians 1.25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So these ages are time past ages. So time past itself is divided into ages. It's not how we usually look at that, but it's how it is. And then also in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might shew the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Now we have the ages to come. So there were ages in the past. There's the age that we live in now. 
and then there are more ages in the future. In the past several years, you've heard me quote verse 7. You've heard me quote this many times over the past 20 years. Those of you who've been with us for 20 years or more, you've heard me say that in, in Romans chap, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, that in the ages to come, that when that he could that today he could have made you a sta a standing monument of his righteous indignation and wrath but rather than do that in his grace in Christ he made you a standing monument of the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ why that in the ages to come and you all heard me say when ages roll upon ages and ages roll upon ages, and eons roll upon eons, and eons roll upon eons. God is going to take the body of Christ and put them on display, put us on display for all mankind to see. So if you've been listening to me for several years, you've heard me say that. You've heard, me, you've heard those exact words. Now, the fact that I used the word eons upon eons. Never bothered anybody, did it? And never, nobody ever questioned it. Nobody ever complained about it. Nobody ever even thought about it. But the reason I use the word eons is because eon is the Greek word for ages. Never said that before. I never told you that before. So, that's one of the reasons I was using the word eon. But I guess when I used it, I was thinking, well, they know. They must know that's the Greek word for ages. I was thinking that, right? So let me put verse 7 with the timeline. That in the ages to come. That in the ages to come. So here we are in this age. There are ages to come. After this age. More than one age to come. In other words... What God is doing in this dispensation of grace has a purpose that reaches further down into human history beyond the fact that you're saved by grace through faith today. There's something more to why we are existing today. It's good to know about the forgiveness of sins. It's good to know about that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But God has a bigger plan than that. This is the first step in God's big plan for you and for me. A bigger plan than the fact that you are saved by grace. There are people asking, well, if everybody's going to be saved... Why, why should we preach uh, the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? What does it matter? What does it matter? Why should we do that? Well, this is why. Because God has a bigger plan. A bigger plan for the body of Christ. He's preparing us for something for a far more glorious future event than you ever dreamt or ever considered. I want to show you these verses at the end of Ephesians chapter 3. Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ. For how long will this? Throughout all ages. Throughout. What's happening here? is going to redound to the glory of God throughout all ages. 
throughout all ages. God has a plan for the body of Christ. And if you're in the body of Christ, you're in that plan. I mean, you may have thought God saved you from the penalty of sin. Right? Oh, he saved me to, so I could escape uh, burning in hell for all eternity. Well, let me tell you, there's a reason why you are saved today and why you, people sitting here right now, why you and people watching me online, why you understand salvation today and the rest of your family does not. There's a reason why you understand the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and your friends and your associates at work don't and you're the oddball out. You're the weirdo. Let me tell you that his plan for you will vindicate your belief in Jesus Christ today in the ages to come. It will vindicate your belief. You may not understand all of this right now. But God's plan has to do with the ages to come. That's what his plan has to do. So I highly recommend, those of you who are asking the question, why share the gospel? Share the gospel so we can get as many people involved in this plan, which has to do with the future. That's why we share the gospel. And here's another transdispensational truth. And by transdispensational, I mean that it was spoken in the past. It was spoken in the past over here, but it applies no matter where you live in the Word of God. No matter where you live. This verse I'm going to show you right now is Jeremiah 29, 11. God said, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. You'll say, yeah, but that's, that's in Jeremiah, yeah. These things, according to Romans 15, 4, are written for our learning. And according to 1 Corinthians 10, they're written for our example. Our example. God has an expected end for every single one of his created beings. And that should make everybody happy. That should make everybody happy. Now, how many of you remember this? We taught on the kingdom of God like about a year ago. And we saw that the kingdom of God stretches, stretches back into eternity until in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then after everything is done, his kingdom stretches out into eternity. And everything in between was created. The purpose for creation, the purpose for in the beginning, which is a, a time stamp, in the beginning means there's going to be an end. Everything that's created is to measure, or everything, time was created to measure the duration of created things. That's why time exists. Time exists to measure the duration of each and every individual age in the Word of God. Every age that ever existed in God's creation. So I'm going to change this timeline with this one. Because with this one, at least in my view, it, 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 it demonstrates in a clearer, more visual manner what eons or ages are. 
A moment ago, I mentioned that ages in the Greek is the word eon. And although in the past, no one, not one person, ever complained that I used that word eon. When eons roll upon eons, and eon, nobody ever complained. But now that I'm saying, I'm actually saying that eon is great Greek for the ages, I have a funny feeling there's some people who are going to start complaining. Not here. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about there. In the, in the world over there. In the internet. So, I may as well just let everybody know that what we're going to be doing in the next couple, upcoming weeks, we're going to look at two Hebrew words, and we're going to look at four Greek words that are in our King James Bible. Not to change the Word of God. There are two ways you can look at a Hebrew word or a Greek word. Some people would look at it to change the meaning. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to look at it to enhance or shed light on something in the Word of God. You'll see what I mean as we continue with this. But the first thing we need to understand about eons or ages is that they are separate periods of time. Each of them stands by itself. They're actually limited periods of time. And the concept of ages or eons is something that we're all familiar with, whether you realize it or not. Because like I said, eons, each one of these is an eon and simply means a limited period of time. That's all an eon is or an age is. You know, we've all heard about the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages We've heard of the Victorian age. We've heard of the Elizabethan age. We've heard of the industrial age. It's not unfamiliar terms to us. You know, when you think about it, oh well, yeah, that's pretty common in our language. Even your life is an eon. If you ask a five-year-old, what's your age? Like, five years old. You ask a 95-year-old, what's your age? I'm 95-year-old. Well, if that 5-year-old lives long enough and he becomes 95, well, when his life finally ends, he will have lived out his age. He will have lived out his eon, his limited period of time. That's what an eon is. Okay? That's all it is. We've heard of the, uh, the pre-flood age, the patri patriarchal age, which was from the flood and uh, from the Jacob to the, uh, I mean, to the flood to the death of Jacob at the end of the book of Genesis. Then we heard of the Jewish age all the way through the Old Testament. We've heard of the Messianic age when Jesus Christ came to set up his millennial kingdom. But he came unto his own, and his own received him not. We've all heard of the age that we live in, the age of grace, or as we call it, the dispensation of the, gra of the grace of God. And then after this age is over, there are more ages after that. There are more ages. Now some ages... From where we stand today, we look back, some ages have already run their course. They're done, they're finished. There's an age we're living in right now which has not run its course. We're living in it. It is a limited period of time. And then there are more ages after this that haven't even begun yet. So at the point where we are now in God's plan, like I said, several eons or ages have already run their course. They're over. They're finished. We live in the yellow one. 
depending on what kind of computer you're looking at me, this may be lime green on your computer, but I promise you it's yellow. We live in this dispensation of the grace of God right now. And for that, everyone that's listening to me is very thankful for that, that we live in the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, what I'm about to share with you now is to be the most important thing I say all day. So this is where I want you to begin paying a, a very close attention because I'm setting the stage for the next three weeks for which I'm thoroughly excited of what's coming. Thoroughly excited. But this I want you to know is that there are no ages or eons in eternity. In eternity past, when the triune God existed as the solidarity or as the sole entity, there were, the eternity was not segmented into ages. Eternity is eternity. Same with when the fullness of time, when time ends and eternity begins again. There will be no periods of time in eternity. There will be no ages. There will be no eons in eternity. So, in other words, it won't be subdivided into sections like we have from the beginning till the end of time, we have eons, we have ages. The only place that we will find ages and eons are here in the creation during this period called time. This is where God is working out his master plan right now for his created beings, who he loves. Who he loves with an everlasting love. Who he loves with everything that is in him because God is love. Now one of the things that's interesting about all these ages is that grace... Grace progresses as, these, as one age closes and another age opens. Grace itself is being more and more revealed. Slowly but surely. I mean, back here they used to say, if I find grace in thy sight, if I find grace in thy sight. Over here, we don't find grace in God's sight. We're standing in the grace of God. We're not finding grace. We're standing in it. Okay? And so, um, as grace progresses, as, as the eons progress, we finally arrive at this place called the age of ages. The age of all ages. The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. It's not called the age of ages in the English it's called that in the originals. It's actually called the age of ages or the age of all ages because this is where the culmination of everything that God spoke about from the beginning all the way through this, this is where it's all fulfilled. Everything God spoke about in the past comes to fruition here. That's why this is the age of ages. This is the one, baby. This is the one we're all headed to. Remember all those verses we quoted a couple of weeks ago about all the families of the earth and all the nations coming to Jerusalem to worship? They happen here. They happen here. But as far as grace as far as grace progressing, 
Do we see that happening? Well, there are mysteries in the Bible that were hidden in the past that are known now. We live in the dispensation of grace now where God is not imputing men's trespasses to them. There's a lot of people who hate that verse. I mean, they despise that verse with a passion because they don't like what it implies. Well, you know what? I'm sorry if you don't like what the Bible implies. But if that's what it implies, it implies what it implies. God is not imputing men's trespasses to them. End of story. So according to verse 7 here, the future ages, the ages to come, will witness the riches of His grace. Matter of fact, they will witness the exceeding riches of His grace. That's who's going to get that. That's who's going to understand that. We're being prepared for that. And they will witness it through us. They will witness it through us in the ages to come. We're going to play that part. We will be an example to the rest of God's creation of what grace really is. Of what it is. How that it's something that we didn't pay for. That we didn't earn. That we didn't deserve exactly like those upon whom that grace will be bestowed in the ages to come. That grace in the ages to come is there now for their benefit. Something you don't understand yet, but you will. You will. God's method of teaching is line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little, here a little, there a little. It is not possible to give the whole ball of wax in one message. People have questions. Well, I got quite a few answers. I can't give them all to you in one message. I wish I could. But that's not how it works. And that's not how God wants it either. God has a method of teaching. And I'm following that method. So, patience is required as we go through these things. So, who made all these ages? Who made all these ages? Now you need to begin listening. I mean, I know you started listening long, now you're going to need to listen even more. Okay, like, those of you that are sleeping, wake up. Notice here Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2, this speaking of Jesus Christ, hath in these last days, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, you would think when you read those words, by whom also he made the worlds, that the writer to the Hebrews is pointing you to the sun, the moon, the stars, the heavenly bodies. I mean, Jesus Christ did make those. Colossians 1 tells us, by him are all things made, both which are in heaven and in earth. So yeah, he made those. But that's not what the writer to the Hebrews is saying to you. The word worlds is the Greek word eon. It's the word ages. By whom Jesus Christ made the ages. See, when you read Hebrews 1.8, if your impression is that God created the sun, the moon, and the stars, it's not me that's not the meaning God intended when he used the word eon in the originals. We already know, according to Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created. We know the Word was made flesh. Jesus Christ is the Creator. He created everything, okay? We already know that. But this word, eon, 
is a limited period of time. And when you understand that that's the word, it helps you to understand what God is saying. Because each and every age was made by his son. Now you might say, well, Brother Rodney, how do you know that in the Greek that that word worlds is the word eon? How do you know that? Well, that's a good question. And I think it's one that you really need to understand. See, I have this free program that I, get from the, I got from the internet. It's called eSword. Here's Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, there's a little tab right there that says KJV. That's the King James Bible, right? King James Version. Right next to that, it says KJV+. Plus. I'll show you that in a second. Before I show you that, let me just say this. I am now pretty sure that when the translators of the King James Bible did things like this, where they used a different word, like this is eon, and it's translated ages in some words else, but here they translated it worlds, I'm pretty sure that they were thinking that those who would read their King James translation of the Bible would also have the same originals that they used to create this Bible. That's what I'm thinking now. Because there are people who accuse the King James translators of deceiving or trying to deceive by doing things. And I'm like, no way. There's no way they were doing that. Okay? So the only thing I can see now is they knew we would have access to these things. And of course, we have access to these things in amazing ways today. That's the only way I can see why they would have used a different word here. Okay? But when, when I click on this KJV+, plus, all of a sudden these, these here's, here's Hebrews 1, 2, and see all these numbers? Well, when you get to the word worlds, you got G165. G stands for Greek, the Greek. Okay? This is what the King James translators, this is the Greek document that they made the English out of. So when I hover my cursor over this thing, uh, the worlds, I, get, I, I know that it's the word eon. It's pretty simple. You see it? There's, that's the Greek word eon. That's, that's, I'm hovering my mouse over that. That's just a screenshot from my computer. Okay, but it's G165. That's the Greek word eon. So this verse says, by whom also he made the worlds, by whom he made the ages. That's what eons are. They're the ages. The reason that Jesus Christ made the ages is because he is the subject of every age in the Bible. They all point to him in types and shadows and allegories and prophecies. They all point to him. They're all about him. All these ages are about him. So yeah, he made the ages. It's like when you arrive at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is a great chapter of prophecy, right? We know his disciples are going to ask him this question in verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And then based on his answer, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Here's the verse. 
Matthew 24, 3, the end of the world, according to him, when he returns, is the end of the tribulation period, the end of Daniel's 70th week, which he returns right there before the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. In Matthew 24, he says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Okay? So he's referring to the second coming when he refers to the, when they ask him, and what shall be end of the end of the world? Well, here's our handy dandy little Bible program, eSword. It's free. You can download it. Anybody in the world can use this. 100% free. But here's the verse. Sat on the Mount of Olives. Disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us what shall, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So when I click on my little KJV+, Plus, I get all the numbers from where these words came in the original. Just like that. It's not, this is not like the Blue Letter Bible. You know, there's guys online, they use the Blue Letter Bible to show the Greek words. And they're, on the, they're using the Blue Letter Bible and they sit there and they play, you know, Jeopardy music, do, 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 while they wait for that thing to generate. Nah, this is instantaneous. You click on it, boom, it's there. You don't have to mess around with all that stuff. But notice, when I hover my cursor above world, which is here, it's G165. It's the word eon. It's the word eon. So now we know that the end of the world is the end of the age. This age. Not the end of the world when everything is done. Especially in the context of how Jesus Christ is answering the questions in Matthew 24. You know, you see the sign of the Son of Man. All this. All this appearing. Well, we know he's talking about this coming at the end of that age. It's that limited period of time that never means eternity. It never means eternity. So the very simple point of this message today is that whenever and wherever you find the word eon in your King James Bible and it's translated into an English word, no matter what that word is, it will never pertain to eternity. It will never mean eternity. It will never be referring to eternity. It will always and only be referring to a limited period of time. That's what ages or eons are. Limited periods of time. You understand that so far? That's why there are no ages in eternity past or eternity to come when time shall be no more. That's why. Now, in the Old Testament, there's a word that is equivalent to ages. And it's the word olam. Olam. And it means a limited period of time. For example, in Exodus chapter 21, verse 5, and if the servant shall plainly say, this the servant is the slave, he has a master. Say, I love my master. I love my wife. I love my children. I will not go out free. I want to remain your slave. That's what that's saying, okay? Verse 6. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he, he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. Okay? And he shall serve him forever. Forever. That, 
those words forever are olam. We know that the servant will not obey him forever as in eternity. Right? Or endlessly. But he will serve him for the rest of his life. That's a limited period of time. But the Bible says to that man, you're going to serve him forever. In other words, the forever of your life. The forever of your eon. The forever of your age. There are many examples of this in the Old Testament. I'll just give you a couple more. Isaiah 32, 14. Because the palaces shall be forsaken, the multitude of the city shall be left, the forts and towers shall be for dens forever. Forever. A joy of wild asses, a pasture of flocks. But how long is forever? Verse, 25, uh, verse 15. Until. Forever. Until. So forever is not for eternity. Forever is until the Spirit be poured up, uh, upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field. That's in going into the millennial reign of Christ there. Right? That word forever? Olam. A limited period of time. But yet it says forever. Now, if you don't know this about your King James Bible, you might look at that as somehow think, you know, forever is for eternity. Look at 1 Samuel 1.21. And the man Elkanah the, and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned. And then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Well, forever is the word olam. And we know that Samuel did not abide before the Lord for eternity or endlessly or perpetually. He was there. He abode before the Lord forever for a limited period of time. So olam in the Old Testament is equal to ages or eons in the New Testament. A few moments ago, I mentioned that this age, this age, the last age, the age of ages, or the age of all ages, is the age where prophecy will be fulfilled and where time will be fulfilled. And at the end of the age of ages, when all is settled and done, that's when eternity will begin. Okay? There will be, again, there will be no ages or no eons out here. In eternity, in God's time, there will be one time of endless glory and happiness when all the families of the earth are blessed and reconciled and have been reunited together. So notice this, notice this now. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, how long is the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Years wise. The kingdom. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is for 1,000 years. This is what we're trying to learn now, okay? I know, this is, it's not forever. It's not forever. The throne of Jesus Christ in this verse is the scepter, which in other words, it's the right to rule. 
When the king bears the scepter, he's ruling. But that throne will be in the thousand-year kingdom. That's where the throne of Jesus Christ will be. But notice you all picked up on forever and ever. Will the throne be forever and ever or until the end of the kingdom? Well, there's some parts of Scripture you're not familiar with right now. I can tell. Okay, the throne will be until the end of the kingdom. I'm going to read a couple of verses. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and follow this with me, 1 Corinthians 15, follow this with me. Because this is important. It's important that we identify and understand things about our King James Bible, who we love, right? Yeah. Now look, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. So there's a time when the kingdom is delivered up to God. Right? To God, even the Father. When he, Jesus Christ, shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. That's the purpose of the kingdom, to put down all rule, put down all resistance against God. That's what he's going to do in that kingdom. Verse 25, for he must reign. How long? Till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. In other words, Jesus Christ is accepted from that, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then, that's at the end of the kingdom, when eternity begins, at the end of the kingdom is when eternity is going to begin. At the end of the kingdom, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So in these verses that we just read, they're referring to this kingdom, which is this kingdom, the throne, thy throne, O God, the, he saith unto the Son, thy throne, O God, the Son is God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Here's the kingdom. But we just read where Jesus Christ, when he subdues everything, is going to hand over the kingdom to God the Father and the Son will become subject. So what are these words right here? Well, there are the words... I'm going to look at this again from our handy dandy. Here it is, verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And what is this forever and ever? Well, we come here and we find 4 is G1519. Ever and ever is G165. And G165. And when I hover over that, guess what? Those are the words eon. Eon, forever and ever, for the ages of ages, for the ages of ages. This is the age of all ages. It's the ages of ages. Now, there's going to be a reason. Where, this is not going to be the last time we talk about this because you guys are all looking like, wow. But at least now you can understand that forever and ever is a limited period of time. It is the age of ages. His throne is for 1,000 years. So forever and ever does not mean for eternity. Because like we read in 1 Corinthians 15, there is a time when it ends. The Son is going to deliver up the kingdom. Here, I did, I completed the work which thou gavest me to do. 
is not just the work of the cross. The work of the cross is important, and he finished that work, but there's more work. There's more work that he's doing out here. You know, even in our own usage of English, the way we speak, the word forever does not mean eternity. You know, you go, you're sitting in a doctor's office for 35 minutes, right? Somebody sits down next to you and says, man, I've been here forever. Well, the person knows you weren't been sitting there for eternity. He knows it's a limited period of time. My wife and I, when we were first married, we went to Disney. Man, you want to talk about some long lines? You stand in those things forever. And you would hear people say, man, we've been standing in this line forever. And the people hearing them know you're not standing there for eternity. Forever is a common thing in the English language. It's like an heirloom. Great grandma had it. She gave it to grandma. Grandma gave it to mom. Now you have it. Boy, this thing's been in the family forever. Isn't that how we speak? The only place forever means eternity is in the deceived, deluded mind of Christendom. That's what you need to understand today. Pretty soon, we will be in the age of all ages. That's coming very soon, right? Look at the world around you. It's falling apart. All these ages have a beginning, they have an end. This age, called forever, has a beginning and it has an end. Because forever does not mean eternity. Because that kingdom is an eon. Now, look at this verse, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. I'm almost done. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this, of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. That's what we just read in 1 Corinthians 15, when He subdues. When he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign. Right here, for he must reign. Till he hath put all enemies under his feet. That's what Jesus Christ is doing in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This happens. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And he shall reign... Forever and ever. Can anyone guess what the words forever and ever are? Eon of eon. He will reign for the age of ages. The eon of eon. He will reign for the age of ages. Just like Hebrews 1.8. Forever, that's how long he reigns, for the age of ages. And then in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, we read, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests. Now, who's that? That's Israel. You know that, right? Hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Now, this dominion is the dominion of the kingdom. Can anybody guess what these words forever and ever are? You're catching on. You're catching on. Because Israel will not be a kingdom of priests for eternity. They have a limited period of time in which they will be a kingdom of priests. It's forever and ever. It's for the age of all ages. That's how long they will be a kingdom of, of priests for the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And again, that in your Bible is referred to as the age 
of ages. Now I'm going to show you a verse where we're going to begin next week understanding one of the most difficult things to understand about the Bible because of this lack of understanding of what we just learned today. You know, at the beginning I said, I went through the, you know, the Pentecostal, Plymouth Brethren, Nazarene, Independent, Independent Fundamental Baptists, and the Acts 9 movement. Do you know that not one of those groups ever taught what you just learned today? Not one of them. And I will tell you that the last group I was in, I know pretty sure a lot of the teachers knew about what I'm teaching you now, but why they're not teaching it, that's going to be between them and God. Okay? But the next verse I'm going to show you, you're going to understand it today. You'll understand it more next week, and you'll understand it more the following week. Okay? But the verse I'm going to show you is Revelation chapter 14, verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. How many of you can guess what the words forever and ever are. Eon and eon. That's right. You're getting pretty good at that. The smoke of their torment ascends until the ages of ages is done with. Not for eternity. Now, this verse says, they have no rest day or night. Day or night, right? A little further on in the book of the Revelation, you're going to read these words. There shall be no night there. There shall be no night. In other words... When the ages of ages is done and we all go into eternity where there will be no more eons, whatever they're experiencing here will come to an end. Now you're going to learn what they're experiencing next week. And I'm going to tell you, this may sound bad, but let me tell you, it's glorious because you don't understand it. Because you've been foiled by Christendom. That's why you don't understand this verse. You think the lake of fire is hell for all eternity, people burning there. That's what you think. If that's the case, why are death and hell cast into the lake of fire? You can't cast hell into itself. There's a lot. There's a lot to learn now. We set, some ground, we set some ground rules. We've established some things. But what these people are experiencing during this time cannot continue to exist because there will be no night here. And during the age of ages, this forever and ever... They have no rest day or night because there's still day and night here. But when day and night end, whatever they're going through will end with it. Do you see that? Now I will tell you, that's good news. If you, and I know you never understood this, which is why people have all these questions. What about this? You're going to understand what gnashing, weeping and gnashing, wailing and gnashing of teeth means. You're going to understand what that means. It's not what you think. It's not what you think. So, next week, you will begin understanding what fire is all about 
in your Bible. Why it exists, its purpose, what it will accomplish. All I will tell you is this. It is good news. The gospel is good news. What's happening in the book of the Revelation is the total destruction of evil. The destruction of evil. Not the total destruction of the evil doers. Now that's something you, I know, I know, I know. I'll have to explain all this, but for those of you who are still following along, next week will be a great blessing for you. It will be such a great blessing. But for now, those of us, we live in the dispensation of grace. This is who we are now, okay? We are saved by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the more people we can get into this program now of being forgiven, the more beautiful it will be in the ages to come when God puts that banner over us to the praise of the glory of His grace when he demonstrates to the rest, this is what they got. They got it by doing nothing. You get it by doing nothing also. Yeah. That's what it's going to be all about. I think about families who have wayward sons and daughters or a man is married to a woman. Either one of them is not saved, the other one is. And there's contention. And I think about those of us who have cousins who died that we know. You know, we all say, oh boy, I'm not happy for him now. We have all these worse pictures of what's going on with them that are not biblical. They are religious. They come from Augustine and they have nothing to do with the Word of God. You don't understand what the word torment means. You will understand it next week. It's actually a really good word. So anyway, right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is a good day. Trust Jesus Christ to save you. Believe that he died, he was buried, he rose again the third day. And God will save you and forgive you. And you'll be part of his greater plan. Okay, it's not just for today. It's not just for today. This life is not a cruel joke. This life is a grand master plan. And you may not understand it, but that's how it is. So... If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today's a great day to believe that He died for you. And God will save you and put you in His greater plan. Amen? Lord, we thank You for this time that we could spend in the Word of God. I pray if anyone doesn't know Jesus Christ, Lord, that today they will acknowledge He died for them. He was buried. He was raised for their justification. And by simply believing and trusting that, they receive the forgiveness of sins. I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.